Salutations, mini mathematicians. We're going to be doing 7.1D today, comparing linear and nonlinear functions. Um, purpose is given a function rule, which we can also call like an equation. It can be written in function notation, f of x, or just y equals. Um, we're going to create a table, so a table of values, input and output, and make a sketch of the graph so that we can really see visually if um, this relationship or this function is going to be linear, have a constant rate of change, be represented by a linear pattern, or be nonlinear, have a curve, have um, some type of multiple linear functions put together to create it. So we're going to make observations so we can arrive at generalizations so that when we look at just a table graph or an equation, we can determine if that represents a linear function or a nonlinear function. Okay, so let's get started. 7.1D lesson comparing linear and nonlinear functions. Directions. Complete the table of values and sketch a graph of the given function. In the tables, round to the nearest tenth when needed. State whether or not the given function is linear and justify your reasoning. So since I'm going to be rounding to the nearest tenth, you probably do want to have a calculator handy. And... Um, what we want to be looking at is thinking about that these are all functions. So notice because these are all functions, we won't have any vertical lines. So taking a look, y is equal to 6. So no matter what your input is, your output will always be 6. And this is just a quick sketch, so I'm not going to use any numbers. I'm not going to number this at all. Um, but I know it's going to be horizontal line. I know it's going to be above the um, above the x-axis so this looks like y equals 6. Is this a linear function? Why or why not? Yes, linear because follows a linear pattern. In fact this is called a horizontal line. You can look at how it grows. As x increases or decreases, y stays the same. And that can also be really important to think about why this is a linear function. Okay, so let's take a look at number 2. y equals, and these bars means the absolute value of x. So if I input negative 2, the absolute value of negative 2, or the distance from negative 2 to 0, is 2. Um, the absolute value of negative 1, the distance from negative 1 to 0, is 1. The uh, distance from 0 to 0 is 1. The distance from 1 to 0 is 1. The distance from 2 to 0 is 2. So taking a look here, we know we're going to have the origin 0, 0. And then notice, as we go horizontally away from the origin in both directions, right and left, our height is going to be the same. Negative 2, 2, 2, 2, 1, 1, negative 1, 1. So this is going to create kind of a V shape, exactly a V shape, not kind of a V shape. And notice that there's also going to be some symmetry. Because we have symmetry in the table, if I fold the table over, we'll see from 0, 1, 1, and then 2, 2. And then the next two numbers, they're also going to be the same. And then following, as long as we keep um, the same pattern. So this is going to look like a V shape. So is this a linear function? No. If we take a look, the graph is made of two, um, a decreasing and an increasing line. So there's going to be two different slopes. They're going to be opposites, but it's still not one constant slope. Looking at the table of values, we're not going to have a constant first difference. So if we take a look at this, 2 to 1, we would subtract 1. 1 to 0, subtract 1. And then we start adding 1. We're all here. We're only adding 1. So we do not have a constant first difference in the table. No table, no constant first difference. Okay. 
we can see that the graph has two slopes. Remember, a linear function only has one rate of change, one constant rate of change, one slope. Okay, let's take a look at our next relationship, our next function. This is a quadratic function. These are really fun. We're going to be working with a lot of these. We're also going to be working with the absolute value function. Notice it is a function that passes the vertical line test. So here, y is equal to x being squared. So here, negative 2 squared, remember when you substitute in for a, va a variable when you evaluate, that's all of negative 2 being squared, and that's really important to use those parentheses or your value is going to change. So here, negative 2 squared, that's 4. Negative 1, all quantity squared is 1. 0 squared is 0. 1 squared is 1. And 2 squared is 4. Again, we're going to see this symmetry in the table. We're not going to have a constant first difference. If we look here, we're going to subtract 3, subtract 1, add 1, and then add 3. So there's no constant first difference. And let's take a look at what this graph is going to look like. So we have 0, 0. We have 1, 1, and negative 1, 1. So if we go over, we're going to go up the same amount. But then at 2, it's going to go to 4. So if we went over to 2, if we went over 1 more to the right from 1, we're not going to just go up 1. We're going to have to go up about 4 times that. And the same thing on this side. So we have something that kind of makes a U shape. This is called a parabola. It's a quadratic function. And this graph is called a parabola. Some people call it a parabola. Parabola, because that's how you can um, remember how to spell it. So this is a parabola or a parabola. And that's going to be the shape of every quadratic. So any um, function that's going to have an x squared, it's going to look like some type of U shape. It might be translated up or down, left or right. Um, get wider or narrower. We're going to look at that in our next lesson, and you're going to look at it a lot next year, too. So really important relationships with this parabola. Um, is this a linear function? No. No, this is not a linear function. In the table, if this is our first difference, if we look at our second difference, notice how do you go from negative 3 to negative 1? You'd add 2. How do you go from negative 1 to 1? You'd add 2. And how do you go from 1 to 3? You'd add 2. So there's a constant second difference here, and that's because we have an exponent of 2. And that's a really important pattern to look for also. So is this a linear function? No. Table, no constant. First difference. graph is a curve, or if we really want to be specific and use that math vocab, it's a parabola, parabola. Cool. Well, let's look at our next relationship, our next function, I should say, that they're giving us. So this is a function y equals the square root of x. So taking a look here, that is where we're going to want to use our calculator. Square root of 0 is 0. Square root of 1 is 1. Square root of 2, so second x squared, because squaring and square roots are inverse operations. Um, square root of 2, and we're going to round it set in the direction to 10. 1.4, next door is a 1, so that's going to be 1.4. We're just going to do that same thing with our calculator to find the square root of 3. It's about 1.7. And the square root of 4, we know, is 2. So let's take a look at how this graph is going to look. We have 0, 0, and then x is going to increase by 1 and go up by 1. So it's got pretty intense growth right there. It grows pretty fast. But then as we go over one more in the x direction, notice we go up, but we go up less than half the amount we went up before. And then notice we go up just a tiny little bit, what, three tenths? We only go up three tenths. We go over the same amount, now we're going to go up just a tiny little bit more. And then we go over one more in the x direction, we're going to go up just a tiny bit more. So notice this is going to be a curve. 
it's going to look kind of like this. It's never going to get completely horizontal because it's always going to increase just a tiny little bit more as we take the square roots of numbers. Is this a linear function? No. Um, taking a look, if you want to look at the table, this is plus one. This is plus four tenths. This is plus three tenths. This is plus another three tenths ish, because remember we rounded. Um, so no, no constant first difference. in table we can say the graph is a curve notice there's not going to be any values that are negative y values or negative x values because um, the square root of a number has to be positive and you can only take square roots of numbers that are positive so that's really important to think about um, if your input can be out input and output could be positive or negative Let's take a look at our last function. This is called an exponential function. And a lot of students confuse exponential functions with quadratic functions. And one thing I like to think about is that a quadratic function is always gonna have an exponent of two, and an exponential function will have an exponent of x, or like a variable. So exponential x exponents. So taking a look here, this is an exponential function, and I know you've probably heard a lot of exponential functions in the news lately. Um, so taking a look, this is 2 to the 0 power. Remember, any non-zero number to the 0 power is 1. And that's a really important part of this um, function and how it is going to act. Okay, so this is 2 to the first power. It's going to be 2. 2 to the second power, that's going to be 4. 2 to the third power, it's going to be 8. And 2 to the fourth power, which is 16. So notice another reason why this is not a quadratic is because I'm not going to have a constant second difference like I did up there. So if I look at the first difference here, 1 to 2, I'm adding 1. 2 to 4, I'm adding 2. 4 to 8, I'm adding 4, and 8 to 16, I'm adding 8. And if I look at a second difference, 1 to 2, I'm adding 1, 2 to 4, I'm adding 2, and 4 to 8, I'm adding 4. So notice I'm not going to have a constant first difference. I'm not going to have a constant second difference. I'm also not going to have a constant third difference. But a pattern that you can see with your differences, your first and your second, is that they're doubling, always doubling. And that's really interesting. And the reason that's happening is because this number is a two. Okay, so let's take a look at what this graph is gonna look like. Um, if we did have some negative exponents, because you can have negative exponents, if you had negative one, that'd be two to the negative first, which is one half. So if you think about this, this function is always going to have a positive output, even if your input's negative. And then at zero, we're going to have one. One, we're going to have two. And we're going to start growing super fast, exponentially fast, doubling our vertical distance every time. Never becoming vertical or horizontal, but getting really close. So this is an exponential function. It has exponential growth. It just goes super fast. Um, is this linear? No, it's not. No, table does not have a constant first difference. graph is a curve. We can talk about how it's growing. It's not growing at a constant rate. It's growing at an exponential rate. As x increases, y increases exponentially. 
Here we can talk about as x increases, y increases at a decreasing rate because it shoots up and it's going to continue increasing, but the amount it increases is decreasing. Uh, if you take a look at this, as x increases, y will decrease and then increase. We have some nice symmetry in this graph. We can fold along the y-axis and the graph falls on each other. Um, if we take a look at this graph, as x increases, our output decreases and then increases at a constant rate. And here, as x increases, y stays the same. So really interesting. So if we examine the equations of the nonlinear functions, what do you notice? So there's a few big things that make equations nonlinear. So nonlinear, we can have x to a number that is not equal to 1. So if you have an exponent that's not equal to 1, so like here you have x squared, if you have x to the second, x to the third, then you know you are going to have nonlinear. We could also have um, the nth root of x. If your input's being rooted in any way, that's not going to look like a linear function. Another nonlinear function is going to be the absolute value of x. And another linear function, non, sorry, nonlinear function is going to be a number raised to the x power. And the other way that we're going to have a nonlinear function is if we're going to have a variable in the denominator. And that's going to make it so certain values of x cannot happen. And if you think about as x gets very, very small, like 1 half, 1 fourth, your output's going to get bigger because it's the reciprocal. And as your input gets very, very big, like 10, 1,000, 80,000, your output's going to get really, really small. So that's going to really be changing the dynamic of your input and output. Cool. Let's keep going. So we're going to circle the letter next to the table if the data represents a linear function. So remember, if there's a linear function, it's going to have a constant rate of change. And also a linear function, we can't have all the x values be the same because then that would be a vertical line, which is not a linear function. So let's take a look here. 0, 1, 2, 3. So we are always adding by 1. Here, negative 5 to 0, you add 5. 0 to 5, you add 5. And 5 to 10, you add 5. So a is definitely a linear function. So why don't you go ahead and look, investigate um, b through h, and then we will check back in with each other and see how you did. Awesome. Okay, let's see how we did. If we took a look at b, notice again we're going 0, 1, 2, 3. So if we take a look at how the y is growing, 4 to 8, you add 4. 8 to 16, you add 8. Sorry, yeah, add 8, and then 16 to 32, you're also adding 16. Well, you're adding 16. Ah, well, interesting. Notice how this is doubling. 4 times 2 is 8. 8 times 2 is 16. So this is not linear. Maybe it's exponential. So taking a look here, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, we're always adding by two tenths. So we just have to see if we have a constant rate of change in our y values. So 0 0.2 to 0 0.4, I'm adding 0 0.2. 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, I'm adding two tenths. 0 0.6 to 0 0.8, I'm adding two tenths. So yes, C is a linear function. Taking a look at D, I notice I'm going 10, 30, 50, 70. So I'm always adding 20 here. So I just need to see if my y's stay constant. So negative 20 to negative 40, I'm going to be subtracting 20. Negative 40 to negative 60, I'm going to be subtracting 20. Oh, and they tried to trick us by just leaving off the negative here. But from negative 60 to 80, we would actually have to add 140. So obviously this is not linear because we do not have a constant rate of change. 
Taking a look at E, it looks like one, two, three, four. We're always increasing by 0 0.1 or 1 tenth, so we can just double check the y's. We are increasing four to five by one, five to six by one, and six to seven by one, which says this has a constant rate of change, change in y or change in x. Remember that is your slope, change in y over change in x. If we take a look at f here, we have one to three to six to 10. One to three is adding two. Three to six is adding three and six to 10 is adding four. So maybe I'll just have to check two of these. Two to four is adding two, four to six is adding two. And I know that two over two does not equal two over three. So I will not be selecting F as a um, linear function. Does not have a constant rate of change or a constant first difference. Taking a look here, I know all my X values are the same. If you had a graph and you had all the X values be the same, that's gonna create a vertical line. And that also is not a function. So this is not a linear function. Remember, we needed a linear function. Just because it's a line doesn't mean it's a linear function because vertical lines are not functions. So let's take a look at H. Hope you didn't fall for G. Taking a look at H, four to eight, adding four. Eight to 12, adding four. And 12 to 16, adding four. 2 to 1, subtracting 1, 1 to 0, subtracting 1, and 0 to negative 1, subtracting 1. So that rate of change is negative 1 fourth constant, which means H is also linear. So just to recap, A, C, E, and H are all linear functions. All the other ones are not linear functions. Notice not just linear relationship, but linear function. Do not fall for the vertical line. Okay, let's take a look at 8. We're going to look at the relationship between the perimeter of a square as a function of the side length of a square. So always remember y as a function of x. It's always going to be y as a function of x, so you can always think of output as a function of input, or range as a function of domain. So this is going to really help us because it will help us know that the side length is going to be our input and that our perimeter is going to be our output. And that's going to help you in other word problems in the future. So let's think about this. We have a square that has side length 1, so the perimeter is 4. Then we have a square that has side length 2, obviously not drawn to scale because it looks smaller than my first one. Um, and then there's four sides, so that's going to be 8. And we're just going to continue, and why don't you fill in that table and fill in that graph pause me and we will go over what this looks like and answer the rest of the questions. Okay, so let's see what we did. We had 4, 8, 12, 16, and 20. And maybe you saw a relationship or a pattern there that helped you fill in this table. The pattern I was seeing was always multiplying by 4. And thinking about having a constant rate of change, just multiplying my input to get my output, I'm feeling strongly that this is going to be a linear relationship. So you have to complete the graph and the table. So here I have 1, 4, 2, 8, 3, 12. And since you're noticing it's linear, maybe you're just going over 1 and up 4 amounts, which is notice these go by 2, so 2 boxes. And that could help you graph this a little more efficiently if you wanted to. I added an extra one because I'm being extra. So taking a look here, notice your y-axis and your x-axis are already labeled, and that's really important for a graph to be communicating that way. So if we're writing an equation to model the perimeter capital P as a function of side length s, remember y as a function of x. So this is P equals, and notice it is 4 times s. I'm going to use a cursive s because my regular s always looks like 5s. Okay, so what does the point 10 comma 40 represent in this context? Remember, this is s comma p because it's x comma y. So here, a square with side length 10 units has a perimeter of 40 units. 
And I would call this definitely a linear function. Every input has a unique output. Given the side length, I can determine the unique perimeter of each triangle. So let's see, is this function linear? Explain your reasoning using each representation. So graph, yes. Graph is linear, has a constant rate of change. Table of values. Well, taking the table of values, if we ever want to know if a table is linear, we're going to look for a first difference. So 4 to 8, we're adding 4. 8 to 12, we're adding 4. 12 to 16, we're adding 4. And 16 to 20, we're also adding 4. So yes, table has a constant first difference, meaning there's a constant rate of change. So taking a look at our equation, the equation, so yes, the equation P equals 4S is in the form Y equals MX plus B. which is slope-intercept form. Good old friend, slope-intercept form. With m equaling 4 and b equaling 0. So that's going to be helpful for us to know. And is this relationship proportional? Explain why or why not. So remember, proportional relationships are linear that include the origin. They are relationships where the ratio of y over x is constant and they're when the equation relates your input to your output only with multiplication so we can say yes for all of those reasons um yes graph is linear and includes the origin Table has a constant ratio of y over x, and equation relates x to y with only multiplication. So a quick little review of, hey, is that relationship proportional? Back to module two. <laughs> okay, awesome. Let's keep on going our last page. So now we're going to continue looking at our relationship of a square. But another thing we can look at with a square is the area. So we just looked at perimeter. We saw that, yes, it was. It is a linear function. And now we're going to look at the area. So we're going to consider the area as of a square um, as a function to the side length. So if we take a look here, side length one, remember area of a square is base times height, or since they're all the same, we can say side being squared. So one squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine, four squared is 16, and five squared is 25. So let's go ahead and graph this. Let's go ahead and graph this. Notice we have area as the output and side length as our input, and they're labeled on the axes for us. So kind. One, one. Notice the y axis does go by two, so we have to go halfway for one, two, four, three, nine is going to be between eight and ten. I don't have a linear relationship here. I don't have a, um, I'm not increasing in my y every time I increase an X the same amount. So here for, I have to be really careful with my graphing. I don't have really like a quick trick for this. 525, 
Wow, look at that growth. But notice it's not growing exponentially. It's just doubling the amount. Or sorry, squaring. So the second difference we might want to look at because we're squaring here. Okay, so write an equation and model the area A as a function of side length S. So area is equal to side length being squared. Again, thinking, hmm, I don't think this is linear. The graph is not a linear pattern. The equation has a 2 as an exponent. Inputs being squared. Let's take a look if at our table. If we look at the first difference, 1 to 4, we add 3. three. 4 to 9, we add 5. 9 to 16, we add 7. And 16 to 25, we're adding 9. But if we look at our second difference, that's where we start to have some consistency. 3 to 5, I add 2. 5 to 7, I add 2. And 7 to 9, I'm also adding 2. So we have a constant second difference. Ding, ding, ding. We have a winner. So let's take a look. Part C. Would this graph pass through the point 8, 64? So remember, this is y as a function of x. And you can also use your graph or your table to help you out. So this is gonna be side length comma area. So if you had a square with side length eight, would the area be 64? Yes, it would. Notice the picture was really helpful for me here to understand what the question was asking me. So here, yes, um, the input of side length, Eight has an output of area 64. Cool. I guess we could say unit squared here and just units if we wanted to. What does the point 864 represent in this context? I guess for our justification, we could also say it makes the statement true. 64 equals 8 squared is true. And what does it represent in the context? A square with side length 8 units has an area of 64 square units or unit squared. Cool. Is this function linear? No, it's not. <laughs> uh, explain the reason. Graph. Not a linear pattern. As x increases, y increases at an increasing rate. And because of that, that's what creates that curve going up. Table of values? No. No constant first difference. And the equation? No input is being squared. We cannot write this in the form y equals mx plus b. So now we're going to look at a fabulous tennis tournament. Love to watch tennis tournament right now. Choo, 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 choo. So we're going to look at a fabulous tennis tournament. And taking a look at this, we are starting with 128 players. And after each round, um, half the players are lost and eliminated from the tournament. So we have 128 players. After round one, there's 64 players left. After each round, half the players have lost and are eliminated from the tournament. Therefore, after round two, there's 32 players. And after round three, there's 16 players and so on. So we're going to complete the graph. We're going to label each axis. So this is the x-axis and this is the y. So what depends on what? 
The number of players remaining depends on the round number. So players in it, in the tournament, and the round, what round number we are in. So we can talk about round zero being when they first entered the tournament and no games have been played yet. So at that point, there was 128. So notice this goes 10, 20. So 128 is going to be just right below there. And sometimes what might help you is making kind of an X, Y table. So at zero, there's 128. And then after round one, you can say like after round number or at the end, I guess. So after round one, half the players are eliminated and there are 64 players left. So round one, 64, it's me 70, so about there. After round two, we're gonna have half again, so 32. 32. Round three, half of 32 is 16. Oh, just dropping like flies. Um, round four, half 16 is eight. Round five, there's gonna be four. Oh. And round six, there's gonna be two. And then there'll just be one winner. So notice it's going to decrease at a decreasing rate, meaning the number of players after each round are going to be less than before, but there's going to be a lesser decrease than before. It's never going to get to zero and it's never going to get horizontal. So can round number versus number of players be modeled by a linear function? No. The graph is a curve. As x increases, y decreases. by a decreasing rate, decreasing rate. Meaning we're continuing to decreasing, but we are decreasing less than we did the previous step, not linear. Cool, great job, mini mathematicians. Congratulations, you finished 7.1D. I miss you, I'm proud of you. You're doing a great job. Please email me, set up a Google Meet if you have any questions. Great. Um, good luck on your homework. And I'll see you later. Video bar out.